And the first one is Matthias Hohmann. Matthias is a PhD student at Max Planck Institute. He is very excited about neuroscience and he is going to speak about their project, Communicating with Thoughts. How many of you have heard about Facebook's latest project about communication with thoughts and typing? Ha, no one. That's no great. one. I actually have it featured on a slide, so we can it, talk about it a little it bit. It was yeah. really a big uh, discussion here in Germany, especially because of data protection, because there are many technologies. I personally have seen some of those a couple of years ago, um, where with, uh, with, the help, with the power of your thoughts, you can manage different devices. Only when you put a, I have tried it myself, you can put a headset on your head, and then you can think about something, and then uh, the devices move around the way you think it. So I think it's a super exciting area. And then I'm very happy to welcome Matthias as our next speaker. Please give a big applause for Matthias. Thank you, and thank you, Petya, for the kind introduction. So, so yes, I come from the Max Planck Institute for Intelligent Systems. Um, we are recently founded institute in Tübingen, and we generally do basic research. We're an institute that focuses on machine learning and computer vision and autonomous robots, so all this kind of new technology. Um, but although we do basic research, we also have some technology transfer projects, and one of them I'm going to show you today. And this is actually this one where we use our expertise in machine learning to interpret brain waves to control a computer with it. Now, why would we do this? Mm, there we go. These are the people that we work for. So we have a very specific target group. These are patients that suffer from amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, or ALS. You may have heard of the ice bucket challenge, maybe some of you. Yes, I see some nodding. So this was especially um, for these patients. Yeah. Because the issue with these patients is that there are only 30,000 of them. They suffer from a neurodegenerative disease that um, starts in the brain and eventually makes them completely paralyzed. So they cannot move anymore, no eye movements anymore, no eating anymore, no breathing anymore. They're completely helpless. And all that's left for them is their thoughts. And we said, okay, we give these people a voice again by taking their thoughts and translating them into something that a computer can understand. So really what this is about then is interpreting the brainwaves. Yeah? How do you interpret brainwaves with a computer such that you can control it with that? But we also believe that our research is not really useful if we don't make it accessible. So we don't just work in lab, but we work on taking our research and bringing it into the living rooms of every patient that would require such technology. And this is also where we think uh, QT can help our case. Okay, so I want to take the time, as none of you actually has heard of that Facebook thing recently, um, I'll take some time and tell you about how interpreting brainwaves actually works, such that you have heard of it. So uh, what Facebook did actually is they recently announced that they're going to go into this business. Um, it is estimated to be a... What they write down, like an $8 million business in 2016 will grow um, tremendously up to 2020. And Facebook say, okay, they're going to go into this and they want to build a system that reads your mind and writes down the words that you were thinking with up to 100 words per minute, which would be faster than any keyboard that we currently have um, on our phones. Um, Elon Musk is founding a very similar company. It's called Neuralink. Yeah? So, so these big players are trying to get into this field as well. But so now, why is this still so futuristic? What is complicated about this? This is what we're dealing with. So our challenge is that we have to listen to 100 billion neurons that fire at the same time. And already here you can see, tracking down an individual thought from your brain is impossible. It is impossible. You cannot listen to 100 billion neurons in, on, like a, on that size uh, and track down what each of them was doing. This is quite tricky. However, what we can do, and this is how we actually work, is we can separate the brains into certain brain areas. Yeah? And from those, we know what they're doing. So here I, I um, have a picture that sketches it out. Yeah? So for example, you can see the occipital lobe, so on the back of your head. This is mainly impo important for your vision. So if you look at something, um, these, this information will be transferred to the back of your head and will be processed there. So we know this is happening there. And then the frontal lobe over there, for example, that is important for anything that requires your attention. You know? so, so this part of the brain will be very active if you're doing some task that really requires you to concentrate. Um, now, which brain area do we pick there? Uh, and, and how do we work with this? So with our ALS patients, 
uh, we needed to find a brain area that is not related to their movements because these brain, these brain areas are dead, unfortunately. So we needed something else. We needed something that they would still have, and that's at the basis of, the, of uh, being human, basically. And what we did is we picked the default mode network that's in the parietal lobe. This network is active when you are daydreaming. So whenever you're doing exactly nothing, actually, this network uh, is active and helps you to randomly generate thoughts, yeah, and just uh, and just dwell in your memories and just and just kind of do anything without any external input. So this is perfect to us, as these patients cannot have any external input anymore. This will be the area that they can still use without us giving anything to them. Mm. Now, what, what do we do then? How do we build this mind-reading device? So what we do is we use a proxy. So we don't specifically ask them to think yes or no, but we ask them to do tasks that will be mapped to yes or no later. Uh, so in this case, we ask them to remember a positive memory to activate this network, yeah, if they want to say yes to a question. Or we ask them to do some mental calculations, which will require them to really concentrate, which will deactivate this dreaming uh, network, right? Because the activity is needed elsewhere. And then what we do, um, thankfully the brain is not just all random, but it uh, communicates with oscillations. Yeah? So, so neurons oscillate in different frequencies and that conveys different information. And we can pick the, the one frequency that actually um, that is relevant to self-referential thoughts, to spontaneous thoughts. We can just look at that. And then we can see, okay, is there more or less activity in this frequency happening when they were remembering a positive memory to say yes? or when they were doing some mental calculations to say no. This is how you build a brain-computer interface. And now just to give you an example, what we actually look at, so this is from an actual paper that we published. Um, you can see here you have classification accuracies of our classifier with these two tasks. So that means uh, if you would flip a coin, it would work at 50%. That's chance level, right? It wouldn't really know. But as you can see, our mean accuracy is significantly above 50%, 73%. In red, you see patient accuracies. In blue, you see subject accuracies. They all work somewhat well, but what you also see, and this is an important point to make, it doesn't work for everyone. Yeah. So, for example, subject six, you see, it performs at 52 percent. That's not really that's not really very good. And we have some patients that perform similarly bad. And this is an important point where research is still struggling. The accuracy of these brain-computer interfaces depend very much on how your cortex may be folded, how good you're doing on that day. Um, the situation that you're in, how well the electrodes are fitting on your head. Yes, yeah, so you have many, many uh, different issues that actually influence the outcome of this classifier. Uh, much more so than if you would look at an eye tracker, for example. It's a super reliable system uh, that literally just makes you spell out a thing with like pointing at, at letters on a, on a screen. This is much, much easier compared to this, where you actually have to assume that the brain is in some constant state uh, over the course of a time, which is not the case. And uh, this is one of the big struggles that we're facing. And uh, yeah, so when we establish that, we then just go to the patient. And this is literally one of our patients performing a task. Yeah, so here, in that case, he was asked to move a ball up or down the, the screen by activating or deactivating this network. And here you see our equipment, which looks a bit messy. Um, and also, what do you think how much this costs, this stack of gray boxes? Give a guess. 10,000. 10, another guess. <laughs> hmm. Yeah, well, what do you think? <laughs> so the plastic comes for cheap, that's true, yeah. <laughs> so this comes for 64,000 euro, this, these four boxes, yeah. And this is one of the big struggles we're having in this research is that we have complicated and expensive setups and they all run in lab environments. But our subjects are not sitting in lab environments, they're sitting at home. So this is now the second part that I'm getting to. We need to make this accessible. The problem is that lab brain computer interfaces really don't scale well. Yeah? So you have this super expensive equipment. You have a wired, uh, many wires actually, wired connection to the computer. Then you have some, I have to say, shitty Python script running in the background that tries to, uh, to synchronize everything and stream this data back and forth. Yeah? So we actually, I think we have three Python instances running when we do such an experiment in Python 2.7 and 3 and 2.5 even because uh, it's like it's some legacy software that we that we need for this for some reason and because of that the researcher always needs to be present yeah this yes please uh, 
Um, that is a good question. I was, so basically, they are amplifying. They're, they're just a big amplifier, basically. So these um, these things that you pick up, um, these brain waves that you pick up here, they're super tiny, right? It's really it's really hard to to take them uh, at first. So they've only to go to an amplifier first to make it readable readable by a computer, and this is what they what they do. And then of course they need to be medical medically safe, so you don't accidentally shock your subject or something. So it's really um, it's quite a complex system, yeah. And uh, since the market is not not everyone has that at their home, so their their research and development needs to be financed somehow, and that's what makes these systems so expensive. Yeah. Um, apart from the hassle that I didn't talk about, that these are mostly wet systems. So when you attach an electrode, at first uh, you need to reduce the impedance between your between your head and this actual electrode. So you need to put gel in with a syringe. You go underneath the electrode and put a bit of a bit of gel between the scalp and your and your electrode to make this fit. We have a 128 channel system, so we actually use a syringe and gel these 120 L electrodes. It takes about one and a half hours. Super tedious. The subjects don't like it either. So it's very complex. Yes. And because of that, the researcher always needs to be present. The system crashes all the time. We need to sit there. This takes very long. We have a lot of lost recordings. This is very unfortunate. Now, what we want really is something like this, you know, where we have a low-cost system that every patient that would require it can purchase. And um, they would have some sort of device with them with a UI to select the experiment themselves with one single red button that they click on. And the raw data will be streamed live up into the cloud where we can actually download it or make some adjustments to it and give them back some sort of feedback or uh, some sort of, of classification based on our pipelines that all happen in the cloud. And we can be remote and we don't have to be with a subject anymore. And what this would allow us to do is not just to do this then with one subject, but we could ship our device globally to whoever would need this around the world. We'll have a server somewhere in Germany, right? And... Uh, they can send the data remotely participating in our experiments. We can download this and then configure it and update the parameters on the fly. And uh, this would then finally break with the limitation that we're currently having, which is that an average study in this field consists of seven subjects, maybe because it is so tedious to record this. And if you know a little bit about, about science and maybe power to to find out about effects, or if you would do genetics, for example, seven chapters is nothing. Yeah? This is very little. Um, so it's very clear that we're at the very beginning of finding out about effects or about what the brains look like of these patients, and we need new platforms to accomplish this goal. Mm, so how, how would we do this then? So for the hardware, we're evaluating different approaches for our first pilot study. Yeah? So uh, there's this um, Muse headband that I talked to you about earlier. So this is the headband that you can just kind of put on and has four sensors here and here. And this is actually marketed as a as a toy, you would say, or as a help for meditation. Yeah, They deliver it with an app that... Um, that then measures your relaxation level somehow and helps you to meditate and helps you to get into a calm state. However, what they also allow you to do is to access the raw data. And this is where, we, where we're going to make use of it and, and look um, if you find anything in the data. Uh, we're also looking at a more complicated approach. This is the OpenBCI headset. You see they actually supply just an amplifier on a chip. This amplifier is Bluetooth connected and can host up to 16 sensors at 500 hertz of sampling rate. Um, what is difficult about them, of course, although the the data quality will be much, much better, is that you have to design the headset around it. Yeah? So there we have to be hardware engineers kind of and come up with a headset that is robust, um, that is easy to use and simple and wireless and, and durable all at the same time. Um, this is a difficult challenge. However, this would be very promising uh, to design custom headsets that work with our systems in particular. Um, but... So that actually raises one obvious other problem, which is so when we're not present anymore, let's say we have a headset that they can work with, then how do they do this? Like they need to put this on somehow, right? And before we have always been fitting the headsets onto their head, uh, but suddenly we're not there anymore. So what we really need to do is we need to build a user interface that implements guided procedures. So we need to pour our expertise with EEGs, with brain-computer interfaces, into something that is automatic and that helps them to go through the setup procedure without us actually being present. Um, and I, I brought one example with me. So this is raw EEG data. Now, who of you thinks that the first signal is a good signal? And the second? How about the second signal? Yeah, it's good. Yeah. What about the third signal, though? Yeah, also not so sure. Yeah, yeah, maybe. And the fourth signal? 
Yeah, yeah. So nobody really knows, right? And that's kind of the problem. If So I've been looking at these things for two and a half years now, right? So I know that the second signal is actually better than all the other three. But who would have guessed, right? Like, nobody knows this. However, if you would pour this into something like this, so then you have circles that fill up based on the signal quality. And once the signal quality is 100%, this thing will automatically proceed to the experiment, right? And it won't let them go further before they haven't fitted the headset correctly. And it'll actually tell them which sensor they need to adjust in order to make the signal quality good enough for an experiment. This has never been done because it was never needed before. This research always happened in the lab. And we're now the first ones to pour this into an interface that everyone can use. And... Um, and now the question is, where does it need to run, right? The patients that we work with usually already have one system at home. And this is the left system or the right system in my case. This is a Toby eye tracker. Um, some of you may have heard it. During their disease, they will progress through a stage where they cannot move anymore, but their eyes still function. And this is the point where they will have installed a Toby eye tracker that allows them to still spell out sentences. Um, this device will probably still be there when they reach a stage where they also cannot move their eyes anymore. And that's why we would want to target this, which usually runs on, I think, Windows or Mac OS. Um, we can target this to actually install our app and then give them a continuous support, even though their eye trackers have failed. And then on the other side, there may be patients that have no technology at all, but there you will find that in this household, probably some sort of mobile device running Android or iOS will already be existing, either through their kids or maybe they have one themselves. And so we would really like to target both of these platforms to be able to capture as many patients as, pos as possible with our system. And this is where Qt comes into play, right? So... Um, because we target multiple platforms, we think that Qt would be a great choice to help us with, to help us with this and uh, provide one seamless user interface that runs the same way on both of these platforms. And then, uh, so what we've looked into so far is the Qt Bluetooth stack um, to be able to communicate with these uh, with these systems that I showed you. But then also Qt Speech is a tremendous help for us because. You guess it, if these patients cannot move their eyes anymore, they cannot see anymore. So everything that happens on the screen needs to be read out to them. And you want to have that by something that really just takes a string and then outputs whatever you gave it um, in some nice text-to-speech way. And thankfully, uh, Qt Speech will allow us to then tap into the text-to-speech um, uh, facilities that are already readily installed on these systems without making any further adjustments, right? And then QML would, of course, be used for a very simple UI with just like one button that allows them to start the experiment. Yes, and so with all this technology, we hope to be able to improve the life quality of these patients and accelerate the research on ALS. Thank you. Are there any questions? Um, right. So we work with one patient that is in this final stage, for example, for a longer amount of time now. And what I see personally is that she always has her eyes somewhat half open. And uh, she would sometimes open them, but it's not really clear when she does that and what kind of reflex that is. So you can't really rely on them actually getting, getting some sort of constant input through their eyes. What does seem to work, though, still is their, um, their acoustic senses. So, so that's why. So you need to turn it up a bit louder, actually, because it's still like it's not working perfectly anymore. But they still seem to be able to do these tasks. If you look at the, at the data over longer periods of time, they're still somewhat doing it. So this seems to be the last modality that they can still use. Yes. Any further questions? Yes? Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, what about other ways to give some input to them? Other than all this right now not being. Uh, um, you mean other ways other than hearing to give input to them? Aha, uh -huh, I see. So um, inducing like electrical activity, you mean? <laughs> very, very, very. 
Uh, yes, um, that exists for sure. Good point. Um, you run into two issues there. First, how do you find out how where to stimulate them? Because you can't ask them. And second, how do you ask them whether you may stimulate them? So, like, they, they I mean, they cannot talk anymore, right? So, um, without anybody's permission, you cannot quite open up the skull and just kind of like and zap them a little bit. This is a bit, this is a bit difficult. And, um, and actually, what we're trying to do with this system is it could very well be because they have been in this state for so long that they couldn't communicate anymore, that maybe they don't want to communicate anymore. This is an open-ended question, yeah? It could very much be that when our system is working and I ask them the first question, do you even want to use this device? They say no, because actually what they really just want is to live in peace. We can't tell. But uh, this is what our system is designed for, yeah? So we want to give them the option to communicate their most basic needs. And if their first need is to not communicate at all anymore, we will acknowledge that and not, and not give them a system, yeah? But good point, right? Yes. Well, a question because you want to replace this like sixty-four thousand dollars uh, amplifier and stuff with uh, small device. Uh, mm -hmm. Why do you need these amplifiers in the first place if small device can do the job? Um, because at first you kind of need to find out uh, where your device even needs to look at. So if you look at this slide, for example, so here you see every one of those black dots is actually one of the electrodes. And um, without 128 channels, you wouldn't get this nice topography where you actually see, aha, this seems to be the brain area that is most active at this point. Now that we know this, we could build a device that maybe just has this electrode, and it would probably be sufficient for communication. But first, we need a larger set of electrodes and do some basic research to find out what is even happening in the brain, where we could go further. Right. But now it all works about activating and deactivating some part of the brain, but that's not really reading words. No. Uh, only like uh, maybe the way Mr. Hawking was communicating by selecting words, by mm -hmm. enabling certain activity. In this case, it was his muscle. Exactly. Uh, right. You want to achieve the same with uh, yes, exactly. so good point. So Stephen Hawking actually also has ALS, allegedly. It is not quite confirmed, but he seems to have it. However, he has been stable for very long, and he can actually use his, his muscle twitch here to select the words in a very similar fashion. So he's not using a brain-computer interface. It's a good point. Um, another point is, yes, we're using this proxy of activating and deactivating brain areas, but it is really important for me to make that point that this is as far as we get today with a 128-channel system. We are not able to read out single words from your brain. This is not possible yet. So what Facebook is telling you is great for the future, and who knows, maybe they'll accomplish it, but this is really in the far future. This is the state of the art these days. Yes. So yes. <laughs> Not yet. <That's> right. <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> exactly. That's a big question all you guys were wondering. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. She does need advice for that. <laughs> all right. Any further questions? How realistic do you think the Facebook project is? Um, is it a matter of time, or do you think it will never be possible? Yeah, so let's say... Um, what I do know is that this Facebook project is not mere product development. So if you look at the history of the iPhone, for example, where they came and made something very easy to use out of technology that already existed, this was development, right? But this time, now they actually have to do the research that would still be needed at the basis of this to develop hardware that can capture thoughts that precisely while making a product out of it. So, so this is a much more ambitious task. And... Um, I honestly, I can't say. I mean, they hired a lot of engineers, a lot of hardware engineers as well, in order to accomplish this goal. And let's say they do have quite some funding there. So I wish them all the best. Yeah, but uh, we'll, so we'll see. So you think it is possible in some period of time? Well, I, can, I can't look in the future. I mean, yeah. who would have thought this is possible 40 years ago? Yeah, yeah. no one. Any further questions? If not, then I think yeah. we're good. Okay, Thanks thank you very much. much.